right. Hello and welcome to Pod Rocket. I'm Kate, the producer of Pod Rocket. With me hosting today is Noel. Hi, Noel. How's it going? Good, good. Thanks, Kate. Thanks for joining us today. And our guest today is Catherine Grayson Nance. Nance. Nailed it. <laughs> I, I, we were just talking about this right before the recording. So then I like... That makes it worse somehow. It like brings on that panic. <laughs> All right. Catherine Grayson Nance. Um, thanks for joining us. Catherine is the developer advocate at Kendo UI working on Kendo React. Um, Catherine, thanks for joining us. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. So just to get started, can you just tell us a little about yourself and um, your role and uh, what you're working on? Yeah. Um, So as you mentioned, I am currently the developer advocate for Kendo React. I've kind of had one of those weird wandering career paths uh, where I started actually in design. That's what I went to school for. And then meandered my way over into development and then UI design and development. Um, So component libraries were kind of like the best of both worlds. As soon as I kind of found that, that felt like I had found my niche and I'd had a couple jobs working for companies to help them create component libraries. Um, When I was reached out to by folks at Progress who were like, hey, we build this component library. You want to come maybe talk about it with us? (laughs) And and I did. It was great. (laughs) Nice, nice. Yeah, I feel like that's that's a, a... An interesting kind of journey. Like, was there, do you, I guess it's probably somewhat common to have like people with design backgrounds working on component libraries, but do you find, do you find that that kind of design background um, lends itself particularly well to like dev advocacy, like your, that role specifically? It's been really interesting. Um, I think in some ways it really has just because it's a little bit different than some of the other dev roles and design for whatever reason, is kind of having a moment now, which seems really silly to say about design, which is something that has been in existence for as long as like humans have been in existence, like painting on cave walls. But design is having a moment (laughs) in tech (laughs) right now with like component libraries and design systems. And we're seeing a lot of these like new ways to categorize and manage the like designer developer handoff. Um, And so it's been really cool to have the design background and be able to to participate in that um, and kind of bring a different different perspective, I guess. <laughs> yeah, nice, nice. I want to get into that designer developer handoff a little bit later because I noticed you've done like some recent writing and speaking and stuff about that in particular, but maybe like to just step back and frame this a little bit. Um, can we just kind of talk about what like Kendo is, Kendo UI, um, just to kind of lay a groundwork for people coming in fresh? Totally. Um, Kendo UI is a family of component libraries. Uh, we have a library for, um, at least for Kendo UI, we have uh, JavaScript libraries for React, for Angular, um, for Vue, and for jQuery. Took me a minute there because <laughs> I am super focused on the React library, um, Kendo React, obviously. So we have a whole bunch of components, well over 100 at this point. Um, and really, our main goal is to like, write the components that are hard to write, that suck to write, so that you don't have to write them. Big things, data grids and color pickers, schedulers, Gantt charts, stuff that if you've ever had to sit down and write one, it makes you kind of want to tear your hair out a little bit. (laughs) So yeah, totally, totally. Yeah, yeah. Um, I feel like I feel like there's, you know, that's kind of the common problem. Is there, you guys find most of the users for kind of UI are like people with existing apps that are trying to just like go in and abstract this low level stuff or is it people kind of building that new or is it a mix of both? Mostly we get people with existing apps. Part of that just has to do with where we've positioned ourselves. Um, We are a paid library. So we tend to have more uh, clients that are kind of at the enterprise level. We're open to anything and, you know, we will happily talk to you about a license and you can try it out for free. But, um, a paid library is just a little bit different and it isn't necessarily the solution for everyone. However, especially for teams, big teams that have big apps, we can really kind of fill and fix a pain point uh, in trying to roll all of that yourself from scratch. Yeah, totally. I guess yeah, that's, that's an interesting point. So what, what like, you know, going in, uh, going with one of these kind of more 
uh, these libraries more focused on larger orgs with big, you know, existing apps. What 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 is like the the pro there of going with with something like Kendo versus one of the like you know open open competitors, the component libraries yeah. that are just out there able to be pulled? There are a bunch of really good open source free component libraries out there, so it's a very very fair question. Uh, but really what we focus on is kind of differentiating in terms of support uh, and what you can expect. So anytime you are adding a dependency <laughs> to your app, you kind of take on a certain level of risk, right? There's a risk that the library might be abandoned, that it's not maintained as often as you like, that bugs aren't fixed as quickly as you like, that whatever problem you're having isn't necessarily high priority to the maintainers of the library. Uh, but when you pay for a solution, those are the things that we can offer you. You know, support always within 24 hours. We have three major scheduled releases every year. Um, you pay once, you use it forever. You get to have an input on the roadmap. We immediately address bugs you bring up. So it's really just kind of, I guess, a question of how much risk <laughs> you are, are willing and able to take on in your application. And that answer is going to be different for everyone, depending on who you are, your team size, what you're building, revenue. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. I guess is there like, do you guys help with kind of the, the integration piece? Like, so say you have a big customer that comes on, they've got like a bunch of existing web apps or properties or whatever. And they're like reusing, they have 19 different table components and 27 <laughs> different buttons. Like, is that, is that something you guys do? Or do you just have the, have the component library and like sell the license and, and, we have a support team, nice. so we're totally happy to be hands-on helping you uh, through any difficulties that you might have. We won't necessarily come in and, and swap everything out for you, but we're there to answer questions and give you kind of direct hands-on support uh, in a case-by-case -case basis. So you can tell us exactly what's happening in your app and we can talk you through it. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. So like, you know... Um, what what does that process look like? Either I guess, regardless of if you guys are guiding the user through it or not, <laughs> say, say say users have an existing app and they're uh, switching to Kendo. I guess we, we could say it's a React app uh, you know, yeah. for the sake of our discussion here. What does that process usually look like? Um, again, if self guided or if you guys are helping them along. Yeah, so um, you will at some point uh, once you have either finished your thirty day trial or you've decided that we're the answer, you'll get a license key. Um, and Kendo can be downloaded via NPM packages and updated that way so it fits right into your normal dev flow. The only addition is that you have um, a validation key that you have to incorporate. You can do that in a variety of different ways. If it's like a private project, you can just put that in there as like a text file. You can use the like GitHub secrets kind of thing if you're sharing it. Um, but once you've got that key set up, that's just what checks. <laughs> uh, to make sure all of your components run. And then you just import into your file, um, whichever our library is kind of broken down so that you don't have to import the whole thing if you just wanna use like a couple of components. A lot of people will use us for some of those really big components that I mentioned before, like uh, the pivot grid, our data grid, scheduler. Uh, so if you are really just looking to have a super powerful data grid, you can just import the data grid um, and then place it like any other component. It works just like everything else you'd use, which is it's pretty handy. <laughs> yeah, nice, nice. Do you find you find people um, when they're going through this? Like, do they do they tend to do it pretty piecemeal like that for a while or like forever? Or are people kind of going all in and end up building, you know, essentially the whole app using like Kendo components? It really depends. Um, and we wanted to offer that flexibility because there's kind of, I think one of the things that we're most focused on is the acknowledgement that not everyone is going to be building their apps in the same way and that everyone's kind of coming in with, you know, at some level of, of legacy, quote unquote, don't really like that word, <laughs> but legacy code base <laughs> that they're dealing with. Um, so we really kind of want to meet you where you are. A lot of people eventually um, do end up using the Kindle React library. Like I said, we're really focused on some of those big components. But we do also offer all your kind of standard components, your buttons and your drop down menus and all of that kind of stuff so that you get that really cohesive look and feel across your application. Um, so, yeah, 
depends on the problem you're solving, I'd say. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I guess with with those with those like with the big components, um, do those do those typically have like, um, I guess uh, presumably they typically have other like items in them that are valid candidates to be replaced with Kendo components. Is that how like is it easy for me as a dev to use my own button, for example, like in a grid or something? Like, are the are the components largely structural, or are they opinionated about how users interact with them as well? So we are more opinionated in terms of if you wanted to replace a button within our data grid with your own button component, that would be a little hard. However, we are very easily, easily stylable. That's a tough sentence. Um, (laughs) We've really, (laughs) we've really paid a lot of attention to the ability to come in and customize components. So while you might not be able to go in and use your exact button in our data grid, you can absolutely customize our data grid so that the buttons look exactly like your buttons. So from a user standpoint, they won't notice any kind of difference um, look and feel wise. We've got a couple of different options for customizing your theme and getting it to look as much, you know, if you want to use some of our themes out of the box and, and not worry about it, you want it to be super easy, you can do that. If you want to go in and customize it so that it is unrecognizable as Kendo, you can totally do that too. Um, gotcha which I like to do because I like CSS. <laughs> nice, nice. That kind of, yeah, that, that kind of leads me to, I think, I think a more interesting question here of like what, um, I, guess, I guess how you kind of balance the, the need for um, like high level design continuity that like a, like a yeah. component library usually reaches for. I guess even a component library is probably the wrong layer, but like a, a design language or a design system is like typically pushing for. It's like, well, like these things should be the like calls to action. Like, um, these, should, like these kinds of things should feel like they have these affordances intuitively. Um, how, how do you, as a component library, it's kind of positioning itself with something that can be easily consumed piecemeal, really like approach that problem of like wanting to control the whole user experience? That's a really good question. Um, I would say that a lot of that comes down to the focus that we've put on the design side of things. Um, one of the things that I like about Kendo um, that is part of what eventually convinced me to kind of jump ship and join the Kendo team uh, was that they're really focused on the the designer experience, which isn't something that I had seen before. And a lot of my experiences previously building component libraries myself was because I had had that frustration uh, with other component libraries and this feeling like I couldn't make it look the way I wanted. I couldn't make it jive with the design system that we already had in place. I felt like you know, boxed in to whatever opinionated choices that component library, that third party component library had already made. So oftentimes using a a third party component library was a really frustrating experience for me as a designer on a team. Uh, But we have really tried to differentiate ourselves by prioritizing that design experience. That's part of why we offer our like Figma kits um, and some of the, the tools and options, the high level of customization that we do is so that as a designer, you can kind of look at those Figma kits, break down everything (laughs) that's in our components. It breaks down each one of our components in like a true atomic design style all the way down to the smallest pieces. You can customize those with whatever design system you already have in place. We've even got tools. um, We have a Figma plugin and another piece of software called Unite UX that can help you export directly from our Figma kits. Customize our Figma kits, make them look however you want, export through our plugin into Unite UX, and then check. Make sure everything lines up, that the design lines up with the code. It's got a little slider you can move back and forth and see exactly side by side how it aligns. And then export from Unite UX, um, and you get like SAS variables, code, um, CSS that you can drop directly into your application and storybook documentation, which is like so much easier. I wish I'd had that. Um, but all in that attempt to kind of bridge between whatever you've already got <laughs> going on design wise and our components. Gotcha. So do you, um, I guess I guess the immediate my immediate reaction to that is I, I, I have a suspicion that most web devs are not working in a in an environment where like i guess most 
designer dev teams are not working in an environment where like everything is already well designed in Figma and like ready to go. It's like, eh, we've got like the general structures in Figma, but we're still like recreating everything manually when we go like, you know, hand it off to the devs and they like do their best and then we change three things and they change it here and it breaks everything else because they're like, <laughs> their abstraction their, their abstraction of the CSS rules is not necessarily completely tied to what is happening in Figma, right? Like in that in the right. design tool. Um, does this does this kind of help with that problem? Are you, are you able to still use these tools? I, I forgot the name of the one, like the diffing tool that you just use. Like, can you can you still oh, use yeah. that export process in, in one of these kind of like systems that's a little bit disjointed, hasn't been totally, totally married yet? Yeah, um, it's called Unite UX is the other piece of software. Unite UX, but, okay, um, got it, got it, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's one of those, uh, we hope <laughs> that in some of those situations, we can help kind of create that like, I guess maybe source of truth is a good word. Mm -hmm. So if you don't already have a design system in place, then maybe these Figma kits can kind of be the start of that. They they live there and they're always the same, right? And the design tokens, we've been very intentional. The design tokens and everything in Figma already lines up perfectly with like the SAS variable names that we're using in the components. So we're really trying to minimize that that kind of shift that you're talking about. So there should be... Gotcha. Very little interpretation that has to happen. Um, and for teams that really don't have a design team at all, or aren't looking to like quite dig that deep, um, yeah. we have some so some easier uh, theming options uh, so that you don't have to go through. Like you know, if you don't use Figma, you don't have to. You can use we've got like a theme builder that lets you quickly kind of go through and customize. Gives you like a, a what you see is what you get kind of preview of how components will look if you like, you know, tweak the colors for uh, some of the, our, our major recurring variables. Gotcha. Or again, we've got a handful of themes right out of the box. You can just use the, you can use the styles that we made <laughs> and not worry about it at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I feel like sometimes that's that's like super nice when you're in one of those situations, like trying to build an internal app or something. Like, I don't care if the button looks perfect. I just need like a pretty looking button. Like, right. yeah, this, will, this, will be, this will be perfect here. Um, been there. Um, nice. Yeah. So I guess I'm, I'm kind of kind of more on, on that note of like, um, uh, like the, the handoff process when we're like, going from design to dev. So in, in these orgs, like let's, let's say there, there is, is a more ro robust design system in place already. Um, and every, everything's like well specced out in Figma. Um, is there, uh, like, am, am I able to use all of that existing like work I've already done with Unite UX and like still kind of have this diffing process if I'm if I'm using a mix of of uh, Kendo and like custom components? Yeah, um, there'll be a little bit of work that your designers will kind of need to do in terms of like syncing up mostly like design tokens in Figma, right? Making sure that whatever you've got already in your other file, you can move over into our Figma kits and apply there. But because of how the, the Figma kits are broken down, um, it's not super hard to customize because it uses, Figma also has a component system that allows you to kind of change something once and then see it changed across all of your, your work in Figma. We leverage that. So you can just make changes to the handful of like super basic components that then, you know, using the atomic design structure are like replicated throughout everything. So you change the button once it changes in, you know, the date time picker and the grid and the you know, everything else. <laughs> so updating your, your stuff uh, shouldn't be too hard. There'll be a little bit of like, you want to move all your colors over, you'll move, you know, you'll set whatever, you know, your border radius and your drop shadows and whatever your design tokens are, your fonts. Once those are set in the Figma kit, though, it's it's pretty easy. Gotcha. So are there are there people using Unite UX without using um, Kendo at all? Like, are there people just using it for the cool like AB functionality that you know of? I actually don't know. I don't have like a really good like case study or something that I can point to. You certainly gotcha. could. Yeah. <laughs> it's certainly possible. Um, because really, it's just a tool to kind of do that side by side. Um. I would say it's most powerful when combined with the Figma kids, but it does not sure. have to be. I can't answer for sure though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, no worries. I mean, it just, it just sounds like something cool. Like, are there other tools in that space? Like that you guys kind of looked at and modeled it after or anything that you're aware of? There are other tools. Um, 
but there's always that kind of a lot of what we were trying to fix was that frustration with like machine generated code right that a lot of times you get with something like that something that promises to export directly from figma and then you get this kind of weird you dream weavery kind of code right. <laughs> to like harken back <laughs> dark yeah. days right, right. dating myself a little bit but uh yeah. but then you have to kind of go through and like revise all of that we wanted to give people an opportunity to see exactly what would be output make the tweaks right there in that like side-by-side -side view um and then have the chance to kind of not just be stuck with <laughs> whatever got kind of dumped out of the the auto figma export <laughs> yeah gotcha gotcha cool um yeah that, sound, that sounds super useful um for those teams that are like yeah just kind of struggling with that oh i hit the export button and it's like kind of there but not really well enough to be used and like it's really just right. that i'm doing like this kind of manual code review process that's you know like super right, you end up trying to like do that back and forth you get like figma open in one window <laughs> and like yeah. maybe storybook in the other like been there, done that. <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. I guess yeah. Maybe on that note, um, we talked a little bit about your history before and like working on libraries from design. What is your um, like? You know, have you have you been working on other component libraries in the past? Is this the first team you've really been on, for like first party? So I've done some custom component libraries for a couple different cool. companies. Um, but yeah, I worked at a place called Herman and they did a really interesting uh, assessment that was kind of uh, like a Myers-Briggs, but to measure your thinking preferences and how you approach problems. They had a whole um, application that went along with that to kind of give people their results. And I did the component library for them um, and kind of their design guide um, and then spent a little over a year at a place called Threat Connect um, that did cybersecurity and worked on their component library, started that from the ground up as well. So I've had a, a bit of experience uh, kind of building building really custom solutions. And both of those places were building applications that were so specific and that needed kind of very custom, mostly like data visualization type components, where a third-party component library wasn't necessarily the right fit for them. Mm, gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. That was kind of, kind of where I was going to go with my next question is, is I'm, I'm, I feel like it's interesting to me because there's, I, I look at these, the, the really fleshed out like uh, frameworks that are implementing like design languages and stuff. And they feel like, like there's large teams working on these. Like there's a lot of energy being put into building and maintaining these things. Do you, do you feel that most companies like, um, are should be in the business of trying to kind of build out their own component libraries for everything like data viz and stuff or if you're you know a, like a, a fledgling web company where do, where do you make that line of like and hey, maybe we need to start like maybe we should start with our own component library before reaching for something off the shelf and then tweaking it i think it really depends on the makeup of your team uh, i think that has a huge thing to do with it um if you have a designer or you have a team of designers, then I think you're in a really strong place to consider maybe building your own. I think it also depends on the application that you're building and kind of touching back on previously how many truly custom components that you need. Uh, and you kind of have to weigh where the time is best spent. Uh, I would argue that very rarely is any engineer's time best spent rebuilding like a date time picker. You know, like nobody's enjoying that. No one's having fun. <laughs> like there, there are bigger, cooler problems that you could solve with with that time. Uh, it could be better spent. So I think in general, my approach is um, to consider a combination, right? Where you could bring in a component library to kind of fill either the really basic components that it feels not in your best interest to rebuild or the really complex components, right? <laughs> that take a huge amount of time um, and a huge amount of manpower to rebuild. And instead focus that time on creating the things that are truly custom differentiators for your application. Uh, so like when I worked at the place that measured the thinking styles, they had a huge amount of data visualizations that broke down things according to their specific system and showed where you landed on a graph and where your coworkers landed and comparisons and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. 
which wasn't something you could have pulled out of a, a third party library. So our time was better spent on that because those took those took a lot of work, you know, as opposed to text boxes and buttons and drop down menus. Yeah. Uh, and we, yeah, we yeah. could have saved a lot of time. <laughs> no, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I guess I, even even in those apps, I, I'm just thinking I, I would I would assume that most um companies even even if they have really bespoke like sp- some specific views that are really domain aware like um specific uh yeah there'd still be like date pickers right like on the oh i'm right. filtering my data like i still need it like 90 percent of my design elements are still things that are super ubiquitous shared like web standard stuff yeah i think at this point there's very little value in rebuilding that kind of stuff yourself um especially i would say now where we have such a high focus as it should be on accessibility, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, And that's not something that necessarily every developer is super well-trained in or super experienced in. So anytime you bring on that task of recreating kind of a basic component, you also have to take on uh, making sure that that's accessible to all of your users. And if you aren't 110% sure that that you can do that, then again, it might not be the best choice. Yeah. 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 I feel like, I feel like it's one of those things where it's just like, there's, there's so much, it's such a rabbit hole of like, you know, building a well, well flushed out component library that can like do everything. I mean, I I feel like even as a dev, it's just like, you know, when you, when you go reach, reach for one of these off the shelf, it's just like, there's so much I'm assuming that is being done for me. That's like, I, I don't, I don't know, like having a clean aesthetic overall and theme and accessibility and like, just not, not having to think about that is such a, such a huge I mean, moon. Yeah, the thing that I think about is that we have a whole team of developers for each one of our Kendo libraries, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> and, and if you if you have enough, if you have the same amount of people at your company, <laughs> you know, and you can dedicate a, a whole team to it, then Godspeed, you know. But mm-hmm. I don't think that's a position that a lot of people are in. I've seen just the amount of work and time and and care that goes into creating the kendo libraries and i think that's a it would be a tough bar to meet if you were also you know your primary goal was something that that wasn't that <laughs> that, that was right. you know actually creating your own application <laughs> so. right 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 yeah so i guess i guess i'm, I'm kind of curious when you're when you're working on these component libraries at these smaller organizations were you <clears throat> what like were you were you looking at anything that was guiding you in terms of like you know, spacing ratios around like text and buttons and like corner curves and how, you know, how far to space the buttons and like positions and stuff like that. Because I feel like with some of these like UI frameworks, design languages, like that's materials whole thing, right? It's like it's super, super opinionated all the way down to that level. Was that something you were concerned about at the time or was it kind of just like, yeah, that looks pretty good. Like, how did you do that? Yeah, I would say that was pretty, that kind of stuff was pretty high priority to me and was a lot of the reason that I got brought on is because I did have that traditional design background. And so rather than that kind of like, we'll just mirror what these people are doing or whatever, when you kind of have that, that design education and that understanding of why we're putting this padding here and what, you know, what's the end goal of making these design choices? What are we, what are we accomplishing and how are we doing so? Um, Got a little off on a tangent there, but, but when you have the, (laughs) the, when, when you have someone on your team who has that knowledge, you can make those choices um, kind of in a specific case by case basis. And like, that seems maybe like a lot for, you know, setting the border radius on a button, you know, but all of those things come together to create a user experience that ultimately should feel unique to your application. Um, I think we went through a period of time, you know, where both like bootstrap and material design were super recognizable everywhere. You could open a website and be like, there's material. <laughs> and I think that that's not the end goal, right? <laughs> like that's not the ideal. It looks good, but it doesn't look like you. And right. then you always want it to look like you. <laughs> yeah, totally. So I feel, I feel like then the trade off that again, the a developer is trying to land on is like, well, I want it to feel like me, but like, is it even feasible for my app to feel like its own unique thing and still like feel clean, polished and sharp without, um, you know, like 
spending as much time as I am building my functionality on figuring out the padding around the button text, right? Like, make, like <laughs> ensuring that that all feels um, like, you know, natural and elegant and non-obtrusive. Um, so is that is that like something Kendo is trying to do? I guess maybe more broadly, like, are, do you guys... Do you guys kind of think at that level, like this is how padding and spacing and all that stuff should look, and that instructs the component library still, or is that is that not really how you guys go about like implementing new components? I would say that kind of comes down to to theming and our approach to theming and styling, gotcha. right? Yeah. So, uh, as kind of mentioned, we have a handful of themes that we've made. You can leverage them. You don't have to think about design or padding or anything at all. With that, does come the trade off of maybe it doesn't look exactly like you, you know? Um, I don't think you quite run the risk of it looking like everything else, but there's kind of a middle ground there, right? Where you don't know if it looks necessarily unique, um, but by kind of opening up all of our opponents and letting you style things and customize really heavily, if that's something that's important to you, if you have a design system, if you want to make those kinds of changes, then we have absolutely full support of coming in and making it look, yeah, however you want. <laughs> so that you you could look at a website and you'd never go, oh, that must be Kendo, because it would, it would look like whatever you did. And I would say, I think, I think obviously that's a lot of the reason why like design systems are really big right now is because that a lot of people crave that feeling of creating something that feels really unique and that feels really different. And that's the benefit of those kinds of systems is you spend whatever amount of time kind of upfront chunking out the styles and determining what what feels like you and what you want your look and feel to be like. And then you have that. You don't have to keep making those design decisions over and over and over again. So yeah. Hopefully, yeah, I like ideally, I would love to see people, you know, you grab the Figma kit, you'd make those design decisions, you'd apply them, you'd export. And then you would just kind of be set, you know, and, and the yeah. making of those design decisions would be the hardest and the most time consuming part and implementing them would be easy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I feel like, I feel like that's always, that's always kind of been the dream, right? Like every, everyone aspires to have like this, the, I guess from the design yeah. system, like all the way down to like the CSS rules, like clean abstractions. And I, we decided we want this, the padding around here to be bigger and I change one value and everything just looks great yeah. because it's all, it's all wired up. Um, and you know, there's a whole there's a whole spectrum one can fall on there, but um, <laughs> yeah, I, I feel like ha having these tools like Figma and kind of pipe, pipelines in place for design, like I feel like we're kind of hitting yes. a maturity there that's making that quite a bit, um, if not easier than easier to aspire to at least. Um, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Um, on one of these teams, you feel like you've got the, the component library pretty built out. You have like a large team of devs just working on this. What like what are the what is, what is the ongoing work that needs done? Like, what are, what are the things that you guys spend cycles on, you know, like kind of once the core components are built out, look good, you have the pipeline in place for users to use, the customizability options are largely there. Like, what is the net new dev work on? Usually split between a couple of things. Um, so obviously adding new components. We're always adding new components. We're always listening to user requests. And there's always something out there that you wouldn't have thought about that it's like, oh, yeah, once you have, you know. Um, recently, I think we're adding a PDF viewer. We've been in process on doing like a task board, kind of a Kanban style task board. Um, we added in the last release like a QR code and a barcode <laughs> generator. There's all kinds of little stuff that like, will come up that's outside of that realm of the usual, you know, buttons, menus, whatever. Um, the more we can add, the more, you know, you don't have to look elsewhere if you have one specific component that you really need. So that's a huge part of it. Um, accessibility is another primary focus, especially because that's always kind of evolving and shifting. And we're learning so much more about how you can, how you can be better at that kind of stuff, how we can build things better, how we can be more accessible, how we can test more thoroughly. Um, and accessibility standards are kind of changing along with that as we, in a more universal sense, learn more about what we can do to, to better accommodate our users. So that's another big focus. I'd say the last one is probably performance, just because, yeah, dev-wise, there's always somebody who's going to be interested in getting in there and fiddling and seeing if we can make it just a little bit smaller, just a little bit faster, just a little bit more performant. 
Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, I'd say those three things probably take up the majority of of the the time in the dev work. Nice, nice. Yeah, very cool. Um, I guess that kind of segues us nicely into what's what's like coming out in Kendo. Um, You know, like right now, what's new? I know I know you spoke about the QR code component, um, the cards component. Is there anything else cool on the horizon? Yeah, so the I think the two big ones in our next release are likely to be that task board and the PDF viewer. We've also been revamping um, some of our, our style options and trying to expose more of the, the styling options to give you, again, even more like granular support. So we're kind of going through there, going through each of our components and kind of evaluating like, right, how can we make this hook in a little bit easier to existing styles? How can we like make sure that you have access to variables and can drill down easily and not have to you know, write a whole bunch of importance? Um, so that's been an undertaking that's been going on. It started with our last release and is going to be continuing. Um, and we are, again, kind of accessibility wise, we are already double uh, A compliant uh, from a WCAG standpoint, and we're looking to move that to triple A wherever we can. So that's been a huge focus as well. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Another, another benefit of, of reaching for a library first and building from there. It's like, oh, we get all these, you know, Nice cities out you get of the all box. these little things not, for free. Yeah. I don't have to worry about. Um, again, like, not that I don't want to have to worry about them, but it's just like another thing on the list. And if it just works for everyone, like if it works for a larger swath of people, like, yep. awesome. Um, <laughs> super cool. Yeah. I guess um, the only uh, only other question I, I'm kind of curious about, and I want to, I want to circle back to this kind of, mm-hmm. um, you know, more, more proprietary UI frameworks focused at larger enterprises versus these like kind of open source, um, you know, this like easy to jump into, but harder to get support kind of frameworks is I'm curious what the community uh, around Kendo feels like in comparison to, you know, like these other frameworks where there's like discord servers and Slack channels and stuff or like that, that seems to be the support, right? It's like, well, people, people <laughs> congregate there cause they need help and they can't figure out how to do something. And then they end up hanging around right. and eventually like they become, or some subset of them become like experts and like hopefully share that knowledge. Do you see that, that process kind of happening regardless with Kendo? Like, is that, is that still occurring at all? We have a little bit of that. Um, so we do have forums and we do have, um, obviously we have support team people who are actively engaged in the forums right, and are repetitive to that, but we also yeah. have people that have just been Kendo users for a long time and really love it. Uh, and they tend nice. to be active there too. We have a program, um, called Progress Ninjas. Oh, cool. <laughs> Progress is like the parent company of Telerik who creates Kendo. I know that was like a okay. <laughs> okay, waterfall, yeah, yeah. um, yeah. But our, our expert users, we call them ninjas, and they are, uh, we do have a Slack community for them. And so nice. there's a lot of good communication and sharing that happens there. We also kind of tangentially, <laughs> the DevRel team for Kendo and all of our products have a shared Twitch channel where we're super active uh, streaming, gosh, pretty much every day of the week, I think, <laughs> one of us. Uh, so we have the, the Code It Live Twitch channel, and we've actually been able to create a really amazing community there. It was something that really surprised and impressed me when I first joined the team and started streaming myself. So that we have like a really cool group of regulars who will show up and hang out and chat, not not even necessarily about Kendo, just about developing and building and design work and whatever they're working on. Um, It's really cool to be able to get on stream and just kind of hang out with our community and chat or build or, you know, talk about whatever, even non-dev related. We were on last Friday talking about um, like fantasy books and and general geekery D&D games and (laughs) whatever. So, so yeah, we get that community. It's a little bit different because it's not as support focused, but I think in a way that that's nice too. (laughs) Oh yeah, 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 totally. Yeah, it's, it's nice. It's nice when the Discord ch- server channels aren't all just like every you know flooded with people always asking questions. It's just like right. I want to be here and support this community, but it's like I don't, I don't want another full time job like supporting my library <laughs> that I'm trying to trying to help here. Um, yeah, nice, nice, super cool. What are you usually working on when you're streaming? What's your? Oh, I've got a couple streams that I do regularly, both on Mondays. So Monday mornings, I go on. Um, 
10 a.m. Eastern time, I do a show called Dev by Design, <laughs> where I talk about design fundamentals uh, kind of geared towards the developer audience, because that's something, again, we kind of touched on it here, but there's a, a lot of developers really struggle with being able to put things together that they feel look good or look professional and just feel like if they knew just a little bit more, if they had access to kind of some of those basics in the same way, like designers, web designers, UI designers have to learn so much in terms of like development fundamentals, but very rarely is that swapped. So that's kind of the goal of that show is to get on and chat design and talk fundamentals for a little bit every day. And then uh, me and my coworker, Alyssa, have a show in the afternoon on Monday at two o'clock Eastern called UI Mondays. And that one's a little bit more grab bag. Um, we will either kind of talk about what's new or talk about what's trending or we have guests on, or sometimes we just build, <laughs> work on whatever we're working on. Um, but it's a little bit more of like a anything front end <laughs> kind of grab bag. <laughs> Is there anything else you want to plug or shout out? point the listeners to? Probably just that conference season is starting. <laughs> We're going to be out and about. <laughs> um, me and a, a couple other of the, the DevRels from Progress will be at Codestock in Knoxville in gosh, just a little over a week next, not this Friday, but next Friday. This won't matter. It's going to come out on a podcast probably after it's done. April 7th to 8th. <laughs> <laughs> podcast um, time. Who knows? I guess. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm too used to that Twitch streaming. <laughs> yeah, right. And, yeah. Um, then we will also be at React Miami at the end of April. Um, and yeah, a couple of virtual ones that we're doing as well. Um, I'll be at Hover, the CSS conference at the end of April, as well as the Women in Technology Summit. So uh, keep coming and they don't stop coming. <laughs> Awesome. We'll include those links in our show notes. And Catherine, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, We will see you around. That's really fun. Thanks a bunch.